Hi, it's Jasmine. You know, that girl who did you know what way before the internet ever existed. Join me and my special guest every week as we talk about anything and everything because nothing is too taboo. So punch your ticket and get on board the crazy train with me, Jasmine Saint Clair. All aboard! Welcome to a new episode of Crazy Train Podcast. This week's guest is one of my favorite people from the 90s. He's actually known as the Warren Buffett of porn, or he's actually compared himself to being the Warren Buffett of porn. So let's welcome to the show, Jim Powers. So when a lot of us think of the 90s and very infamous, um, mischievous men of the 90s porn industry, of course, the name Jim Powers comes to mind. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I did a lot of the 90s. I love the 90s. We were constantly jumping the shark, they tell people. It was like it was probably the craziest period in porn, I think. Especially the late nineties. And you did quite a lot of different things. I mean, you have quite a body of work. Um, I wanna ask you, because I always like compare the era of adult now versus the nineties. What do you think they lack now aside from like actual porn stars? Well, okay, the nineties by the end of the 90s, you know, because it, it was like I said, we were all trying to outdo each other in crazy stunts. I mean, it really was like a jackass period. It was the era of the, you know, the world record setting gang bangs and, you know, Bukaki and, and the face fucking as a sport. And, you know, you know, we're doing, you weren't just doing, you know, double penetrations. It was triple penetrations and stuff like that. So, you know, we we're trying to quadruple penetrations. So we were trying to constantly do these crazy, crazy things i don't see so much of that anymore it's i mean we can get into a lot of stuff you know now with the consent and all this type of stuff and people complaining on twitter and stuff you didn't have in the 90s but i just thought the girls were so much crazier and what we did was just a lot crazier there's a lot of things i could tell you that are different and just why it was different but anyway when i look at the 90s that's how i describe the 90s to people it really was wacky times and you know you never want to just have one guy come on a girl on the scene. Ten guys would have to come out of a closet like a baker's does and it had to come. Ew. And it was just how it was. Yeah, that's disgusting. That was what, American Bukkake? Were you the person that founded that whole, like, genre of Bukkake? And why would you, like, what made you come up with this shit? <laughs> All right. So Bukkake, <laughs> I used to shoot for a lunatic named Jeff Mike. It was yeah. JM Productions. Complete lunatic. And what would happen is he would like a lot of times I would come up with some things, but he would like come up with something, go, Jim, we need to do this. And what it was, somebody went to Japan and found out about the Bukakis is what this was. And they did some stupid little video where it was two guys jerking off. Him and his buddy jerked off on the girl and they called it the Bukaki. So I go into Jeff Mike's office. He says, Jim, I need to show you something. And he pulls out this VHS and sticks it in. And I'll never forget so in this room, this girl comes out, a little Japanese girl, and she's wearing these Playboy bunny ears, and she's dressed in a little cute little Playboy classic outfit they used to wear. And, and she's just masturbating. And then all of a sudden you realize the room is nothing but there's men, about 50 men around her, and they're all sitting in white underwear, and they're just watching her, and she's masturbating. And I'm watching this fascinated because they haven't said anything. And the camera pulls back, and then all of a sudden you hear, and they all rise up. And then you hear another clap. They pull out their underwear. Third clap in unison. They throw them and they yell, Bukake. And then they just walk, and one at a time, they just jerk off in her face. But it was Japanese, like pixelated it. You know, you can't see pubic hair mm-hmm. or cum. But so they're all jerking off in her face one after another. And I'm like, I'm like, how the fuck are we going to do this? First of all, where am I going to get all these trained guys that are going to listen to me like this? Which I did from prison, because this is what we ended up doing. But so we, I'm like, how are we going to do this thing? He's like, I don't know, but this is, we need to do this. I'm like, okay. So what we used to do is we used to launch lines within this thing called perverted stories. Mm-hmm. I used to do a line called perverted stories, where I sew pig masks on you, or that's the one where dinosaurs would fuck the girl, or the girl would... Yeah, we just any crazy thing we could do, we put into it. It's kind of like The Simpsons or whatever that one show that where The Simpsons came from. We try out things that if it worked, 
you make it a series is how we would t test market things. So we did a sample Bukaki where, I, you know, it's a class. You get all the guys that really weren't working. I was shooting a lot. Hey, guys, can you come over to my office? We're going to shoot it in my office. At the time, I actually had a company. And come over to my office in the warehouse. And I got like 18 guys. And we recreated it just how we saw it in the video. I forget who the girl was. And I did the exact same thing. Tried to keep the guys quiet. Kept control. I just did it just like that. And it got great response. So Jeff Mike says, you need to do this again. We're going to make this a series. So um, I did it again. If you remember, do you remember when Brooke Ashley caught HIV? Remember the big anal gang thing? Yeah. Well, anyway, we figured, well, that's the same thing you could do because Bukaki later became OSHA approved later on. If you think it's really, we just jerked off on her face. It's no big deal. So we shot her in one of these and we got like 20 guys, but it was hard getting the guys. So what started happening, Bukaki, you know, you're going, well, Jim, how'd you start getting all these guys? Yeah. Uh, Gabor came to me and said, we need to break the gangbang world record. Because I was always competing with that asshole Bowen, John T. Bowen. Remember, he's remember dead. That guy? Yes, I know, but yeah. he's dead. <laughs> he's a dick. But anyway, you know, like, so I was always competing with him. So I go, we're going to do a, okay, we're going to do the world record break. My, by the way, my gangbang had more, but more than anybody. We actually had 158 people to fuck her. You know how it was, just tag her with your penis and it counts as one. Throw a hat on Dave Harbin. We'd put him through the line seven times. You know, everybody did that. I plead the But we actually had a, yeah. I had 158 penises actually fuck that girl. The, the spawn 551. But, you know, a lot of guys would do it 10 times just to get the numbers or whatever. So, anyway, he had a guy who worked at Jurassic Park that became that was a fan that said, Jim, I'll help you get the guys. So, I figured, well, to get guys, I would do advertising in laundromats and things like that. And I did ads <laughs> on LA and LA Reader. Remember all these old magazines? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're in, a, you're in a, I figured you needed money if you're in a laundromat. So, I'd go put a sign up in there. And, and so we started getting guys this way. So now I had access to getting all these new guys because the male talent wanted too much money, right? And wouldn't do the bakakis. After a couple, you know, oh, that's, we're too good for this. We want scenes, right? So we had to, I had to get an unlimited supply of semen. So we started running these ads. And what, so when we started doing the bakakis, as it started growing, I needed a guy who was just on the phone. I did the Bukaki hotline and everything that could call in. And we were running nonstop advertising. We'd do the Bukakis three Wednesdays in a row. And I'd have to do them near a bus line. So the guys didn't have jobs. Also in those days, do you remember Rob Spallone had that test facility and they did the ELISA testing? Yeah, I remember him. ELISA testing, you get the results how fast? Remember, half an hour? Yeah. So I would do it there. I would pay for their test. They'd come over to the place. It was only $35. I was paying them $50, so they'd make 15 bucks. But they'd also get the next two weeks, because so tests were good for a month back in those days, where they would make their $50 each time coming. And, hello, they're coming into porn and getting a chance to be found. You know, if you have a big cock, it gets hard. I'm going to use you in your other stuff. So we started getting more and more people, like 60, 70, 80, really fast. And now it was the problem I had with the porn crew. You know what they're like? They couldn't handle this. The guy worked at Jurassic Park. So I got all the guys from Jurassic Park and I would run it like a theme ride where I'd have 20 people in there. You'd have to keep the rates down, but I'd have a, a crew. So I actually hired the Jurassic Park crew. And all those people from Universal would be my line, security guards, everything you'd go through because we were getting up to over 100 guys now showing up. You know how, how what that, what, especially in those days, what that was like on a porn set to keep them in control. And then what, it just blew up. You know, Howard Stern, this guy named Melrose Larry Green or yep. something like that mm -hmm. would come and he would do live broadcasts from the Bukakis. And that's how I ended up on Howard Stern with Howard and all that stuff because the Bukakis blew up. And we were just getting, you know, like I said, we'd get like 125 guys and some of those Bukakis would be showing up to jerk off on the girl. And we, then you'd have the Bukaki groupies, the girls coming by, they have the chicken hawks trying to steal all my guys, you know, for their shoots for the other companies and stuff, the baker's dozens and whatnot. I call that chicken hawking when you're after my boys on, on the streets out there because they'd be lined up outside. And um, yeah, but that's, you asked me how we did it. That's basically how I did it. I ran it like a, much more like a theme park ride and I appealed to the masses. It wasn't, the regular porn guys, I put up advertising, and that was before the internet. 
So I was doing an LA Weekly. I was doing the ads. I had the Bukaki Hotline. I was putting up flyers back in those days, like laundromats. If you're in there doing your clothes, heck, maybe you want to become a porn Wait star. Wait a second. You said people that go to laundromats don't necessarily have money. Now, I went to a laundromat a few times because my washer was broken. So what? Is that how you got porn? What? Is that how you got in porn? No, 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 no. You just said before with the Bukaki, people who go to laundromats don't necessarily have money. What I said is I've been to laundromats when my washing machine broke down. So what made you draw that connection with people who don't might not have money going to laundromats? Because you don't have In a washer dryer in your house. Huh? You don't have a washer and dryer. Maybe you're like living in an apartment or the dorms or something. You need extra money. Huh. Interesting. I've never spoken to anyone at a laundromat, but um, I think it's very cool how you got these knuckleheads involved. And sorry, I'm we calling had them tons of them. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That, we, we, we would get, that's, you know, the whole term mope came from that whole era. What you was know, it? These are the guys that hang out on other people's sets, you know, because they were just there, be there for the baker's dozen. They mope around. So they start calling them mopes. Now, were there any breakout male stars or male performers from this whole thing? Tons. Really? Tons. Yes. I mean, there were a lot of guys who were secret Bukaki fans, big time male actors over the years that would just come by to shoot a load and join the masses, like Evan Stone would do it. Um, you know, like the very first Bukaki, John Doe is one of the guys in there. Dave Hardman is in the very first Bukaki, if you take a look at it. But that remember the first ones, I was getting all the regular guys. So just, hey, what are you guys doing? But you would have a lot of these guys. I was constantly getting guys from the Bukakis, constantly. You know, like, you know, like I don't know what to find a big career in porn back then. But a lot of the guys, they could get work and they would could enter porn that direction. They were getting their tests paid for. You know, so remember when you started doing the Bukakis, the you know. All of a sudden, they had a test, and everybody needed them to do. There was another world record breaking gangbang usually coming down the pike, right? There was always some blow bang or something. You know, uh, remember it? That was a, especially later on when red light and stuff started blowing up, and you had Brandon who would always hang out the Bukakis. And, you know, Brandon couldn't come unless a bunch more penises were beating off in the room. So he would start getting the Baker's Dozens where he'd fuck the girl, and then they'd all come and join him in jacking off on her face afterwards. So all these guys are always being snatched up from the Bukakis. Where do you think they were getting the guys from the Houston 500 for? From my Bukakis. Who do you think they were hiring? The, the, the guy who tried to unionize the Mopes. Rocker from my Bukakis. Yeah, I'm glad I avoided the whole Bukaki thing. Because I wasn't specifically, um, I wasn't necessarily friendly to the male talent. Especially like the newcomers. I was not I was not easy. We well, were supposed that. to talk to them at Bukaki's. You weren't allowed. We kept you in the back, and, we, and they weren't allowed to talk to you. And but the, we would always. I had to book extra girls just in case something happened. The first girl, <laughs> you know, didn't make it or something, or was passed out or something. Whatever would happen, you know. Um, but it, I'd have girls crying that couldn't do the Bukaki's. It, it became a serious badge of honor. Think about it. these guys are beating off. You're not even touching them. The power you have. It's the ultimate empowerment video. It was pure feminism in action is what it was. I think I made a lot of people very happy with Bukaki. I was sad when I went in the Hall of Fame way back when, because I said, oh, my career's over. What do you do after Bukaki? So I've just dredged along ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you had a body of work prior to Bukaki. Yeah. Let's let's not yeah. forget like your infamous uh, stint, you know, filming people on the beach as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still go on the beach all the time doing pickup shots. You know, you just got to be careful. I learned, you know, don't do it in Malibu when people are coming down because they arrest you and put you in jail. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea. Just stay out of Malibu if you want to shoot porn. Um, I want to know where most of your influence came from because I did read your bio. It said like horror films and comic books. And speaking to you here, I could totally see that. Uh, what drove you to get into porn? And don't say it was the money or the chicks because... No, it wasn't. I didn't mean to get into porn. Now, you know that. I never meant to be a porn person. It was, uh, long story short, as a stockbroker, company went under. My buddy says, hey, raise some money. Let's do this uh, kickboxing video. Remember kickboxing? It's 1990. It was in uh, West Palm. And 
And then when he found out that the guy who was going to do the kickboxing thing was involved in porn, he used to be involved like with Tracy Lords and stuff way back when, nothing wrong. I mean, he was just a porn producer, but my friend at the time, partner's like, oh, we can't do this. And I'm like, why? Why can't we do it? Because, Jim, don't you know anything? The porn's the mafia. You don't want to get in bed with the mafia. We're going to have to walk away from this. I'm like, oh, well, it makes sense to me. I don't want to be in with the mafia. And so um, anyway, that's how it all happened originally because – we ended up trying to, he also owned a one stop. So we had like a hundred thousand horror movies, like Nightmare on Elm Street, those Night of the Living Dead, that type of crap, right? And do you remember the days of extended play videos? Do you guys remember what extended play was? Yeah. Those were the cheap ones that went into the Walmarts. Remember there was a tiny little spool, of really bad quality. Anyway, they would sell extended play on this one, on this one stopping. So we had to unload all this stuff. And because we were trying to raise money on the kickboxing thing, I accidentally ran into a porn guy, uh, a distributor on the East Coast up in Orlando. He had a guy with him named Buck Adams that was living with him at the time. Buck Adams, the old porn. Remember Amber Lynn? Yeah, his Amber Lynn's brother. brother. I got into porn as Buck Adams' producer. I meet Buck Adams. And we are start out this distributorship in Orlando and... Long story short, he's like, Jim, you need to be producing porn movies is what you need to do. So in 1990, I moved back to L.A. and I did my first movie with Buck Adams. We shot a film. But, you know, I lost money. It's like one of those things I didn't mean to do it. It's a one-time thing, never again. Then I ended up filming some boss at some uh, loan job I had. I was doing loans for people raising the businesses. And he found out I did porn. Jim, can you get some girls over here? We'll make an amateur so I filmed him fuck him, my boss in his office. And it was like one thing after another where I fell into porn is all it was. And the next movie, I, I never meant to direct it, but the director was on acid. And he was laying on the ground staring at a cigarette. So I had to take over directing, you know, because he was staring at the sky. So, you know, it's like one thing after another. That's how I ended up being a cameraman. You name it. It was all accidental. So, no, I never it took a couple of years. I never meant to become a pornographer. Were you a stunt cock at any point? Everybody stunt cocks. <laughs> really? No. I didn't know. No, seriously. Did you? No. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. I've heard of this before. I just never, like, first time. Well, heard of it. You probably had plenty of stunt cocks. None of the movies you ever did, you got stunt cocked? No, I was just, the other no, no, no. People knew walking in that they were dealing with what they were dealing with with me. So either if you don't have your shit together, then go home and we'll just shoot another day. Because I had important things to do, like nail appointments and stuff. Like what I remember when Tom Byron stuff? had a problem keeping it up and I was looking at my nails. You know, who was it? John Bone. Oh, we're trying to shoot a movie here. Yeah, I get it. Okay, whatever. Like the world doesn't revolve around a fucking porn film. I just think hey, what are you doing in the fire out of your ass yeah yes i remember that's what you were known for shooting fire out of your ass oh that was that silly that was that gadget um that my friend made and his house got burnt down like a few days later Dude, that's what i mean porn in the 90s was nothing but circus tricks like that yes. we were jumping the shark it was the end of happy days the final season where the fawns was jumping the shark over and over is what the late 90s was Every, literally every month I was having to do something wacky again, jumping the shark. You know, I remember the candy apples gangbang. I tried to combine that with extreme sports where I had the skateboard ramp in there and I had the band. I remember playing. that. Yeah. And then we got busted. And because I had the permits, they like lined up all the riot squads. I refused to <laughs> shut it down. That came into place. But then they busted me for not having an entertainment, an entertainment nightclub license, not a shooting permit. So I got busted for that. And we just grabbed all the tapes and ran out of there. <laughs> I could see you doing but, that. Yeah. But we have to yeah. save the movie. You know, I got busted on the beach. They took the footage. Huh. Yeah. You've done a lot of very, um, uh, very gray area type things, I believe. Like, it's right on that border of gray area. Like, can I get busted or should I be busted right now? But it seems like you got away with it. Everybody in the 90s got... How many sets were you on where it was lined up by the cops because it's a permit issue? Zero. Or there's no permit? Zero. Because I was under contract. I was always... I was in a studio. I was at a house. But we I've never had a brush up with the popo. With yeah, the popo. but you were... Well, Bowen... 
I guess Bowen mostly does stuff in studios, right? Yeah. But you were you weren't like a, like just doing a shoot for Tom Byron or something. You sort of at some house with no permit, and the neighbor happened to think a prostitute went in there and called Vice. No. The nineties. I must have had thirty times had cops. It deals at least thirty times cops lined up or whatever. Somebody being arrested. Something happening. At least maybe more. Like you go down for something, you go down for something way better or like way bigger and gangster than shooting a porn. I'm sorry, like it's like they wouldn't take you in. They just line you up. They they, they run everybody for their you know whatever. Somebody gets a fine or whatever. And you're sitting there and not being allowed to leave. You know, and they don't really arrest you because once it gets down, you're really shooting without a permit. And they they would arrest the people that were having sex outside, you know, or whatever it was. The neighbors called on maybe the cameraman and the producer. That would be it. There, everybody else would, you know, be have to sit there for hours while they, you know, you couldn't do anything. It was just how the nineties were. Well, let me ask you this: What, who would you say was one of the more pleasant people to work with during that era that you ever shot? Well, okay, the nineties. Somebody from symbolic of the nineties, a male, Dave Hardman. To me, was Ew. a symbol of the nineties. Yeah, but you're saying he was. A, he was to me. He was a symbol. He would do anything. Come on, how many times did Dave probably do end up having a deep DPU or something in the scene? Well, yeah, but he had a mullet and his mom shot porn. So, yeah, no. Okay, give me another one. Get, I shot, it. I'm the one shot his mother. You yeah, shot, shot his shot mother? His I'm the one, yeah. That, that was me. I also shot his sister. The mother what? stories are funny. I shot his sister, too. Wait, was he doing a scene with the sister? No, but there was a guy who was failing, so Dave to fuck with her walks in the room and goes, Hey Jim, do you need me to stunt cock this? Woo! She got mad. She like took something and threw it at him. It was so funny. Yeah. Okay, and female wise. I loved I think Missy was back in the nineties, right? Missy. I loved Missy. God, I could probably name a bunch. I, I mean, who would I shoot a lot? I loved um Candy Apples. These are some of the girls that would just tend to be around a lot. Uh, Missy, Candy Apples, mm -hmm. Fallon, I guess, in the early 90s. Remember the original Squirt Queen? No, she but now the, I do. <laughs> she was the first girl that made squirting famous. The Foresight Theory, there was Fallon. She was the Rain Woman. Remember that series, The Rain Woman? That, that was Fallon. Uh, Debbie Diamond. Debbie Diamond was a lunatic. There's four I named. I probably could name a bunch more, but those are four good ones. I remember Missy, and I think she was married to Mickey or something, a, some dark-haired guy, kind of good-looking. Uh, so do you, what is it like now shooting porn versus back then? Are you looking for a safe way to bet online where there is something for everyone, including yourself? Then go to betonline.ag where I am sure you will find something. Don't forget, it's betonline.ag for the most variety and the safest way to bet online. It's like you don't have the excitement. It's too planned. You know what I mean? It, like, here, okay, here's another thing we used to do. I used to do a lot of stuff. I was always on set till 3, 4 in the morning. That's just how it was. I don't know, you know, because we try to do a lot in a single day, more bang for the buck. You're not like that anymore. I mean, typically I'm done by 8 o'clock. You know, do just two scenes a day, and that's it. The 90s, man, I tried to pack in as much as I could in a day. So it would make for these more of these chaotic sets because you'd have so many people there. I think it was a lot of it. And I would do things also in very uncomfortable environments. I love being in the desert. I love being in these white trash, you know, horror type of houses we'd shoot at, these crazy locations. You know, and we did a lot of, like, big studio stuff, like at Bobby's studio. Remember Bobby? Yeah. Uh, Mid Valley Studios. And we used to do these really cool sets and stuff. I really just don't have that type of stuff I do anymore. So I think a lot of it had to do with what's different now is I had these much longer days with more people there and just more chaos involved. And I think the girls, they weren't, there was no social media around. So they, you know, they could be on meth or something. You remember how it was. Yeah. And they weren't being outed like they would be now. You know what I mean? It was just a thing. Oh, yeah, Mila, we know that soda pop in there. You know what I mean? You know, you know damn well she's drinking vodka, but you really looked the other way back then. Mila. Remember Mila Shabal? Oh, I know Mila very well. I used to go to barbecues at her family's house. They're Russian heavy vodka drinkers. I totally do. Yeah. 
Yeah, Mia, Mia, Mila and her sidekick, what was her name? Uh, Alyssa something. Remember her sidekick? The blonde, yeah, I remember her. The brunette. The brunette yeah. she hung out with, the two of them. The gruesome two of them. The two of them would come with big gulps. <laughs> and you know damn well what was in these big gulps that they would drink. It would just be solid vodka and whatever, soda or whatever they put into it. And those two would just be, you know, psychotic. But there were tons of girls that were like that. Anyway, the point being, it was kind of looked at the other way. You know, you didn't really care. And, you know, it's just how the, how those days were, you know. With, and, the, and the drugs were, it's not like people were, you were trying to shoot people because they were on drugs, but you would look the other way and they weren't being exposed or being on drugs, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like if a girl was fucked up on a set, you didn't, it wasn't a big to do. She'd go pass out for eight hours in the other room. Then when she sobered up, I'd shoot her at two in the morning. Is she okay now? Yeah, now she's alive, you know. All right, come on. Because somehow you know how it was. It was just how the 90s was. So it was just like, I think you had a lot more give and take with that type of stuff. You know? I feel like it's more um, it's more strict these days. And you really yeah, have to watch these and cues and like you're walking Thank on you. eggshells with talent. Is that a, is that a decent assumption? Totally. That yeah. Totally. You know, you, you know how it was, it's way different now. Everything's way worked out. That's what I'm trying to say is somebody shows up pat, drunk like that. You're not even going to shoot them. Hey, hey, what are you doing here? Or they're not going to show up at all anymore. It's, it's a different world, you know? It, it's just so much different. And those those days, these people, talent would almost take care of the other, a, a girl like that or something. You know, David would say, stick her in, you know, in my room or whatever, and, you know, just hide her until she sobered up. And then we'd bring her out later to shoot. You know, but nowadays they wouldn't even show up because they'd be worried about somebody saying something. That's why I guess what I'm saying it was like, it's now, it's not that they're, it's not that young people aren't still doing drugs. Obviously people are doing this type of stuff, but you just can't do it on set like you used to and be able to get away with it like people would. I mean, here's another thing. I used to, I did all that college stuff in those days. I mean, throughout all the way up to probably 2010, 12, those wild college things. I don't know if you know that I did all that type of stuff. Like almost like girls gone wild to Kelly, the co-eds at colleges. Nobody does that type of shit anymore where you have hundreds of drunken fraternity guys, you know, and they'd be doing sex as if they were pretend like these were actual college people. And that, you know, these sex scenes would break out. You don't do that stuff anymore. And we, that was just the type of stuff we did back then. Nowadays, nobody would do that. So you, you just don't have that stuff anymore. But I think maybe it is because it, a lot of it was legal gray area anyway. If you think about the 90s, porn had just become legal to shoot in what, 89? Yeah, around that So area. it was, you know, it was a, a, everything was in a gray area. What did it matter? You know? Do you follow Stern anymore? No. But I didn't follow him back then either. Oh, <laughs> so. okay. I, I, I followed the Howard Stern show for six months of my life back when I was a <laughs> stockbroker only because I'd have to drive downtown super early in the morning and he was on the East Coast that so he'd be on so I could hear him while I was driving into the office and I was in traffic. So it'd be like an hour and a half and I lived, you know, like Howard Stern was the best in the morning listening to. So I, I'm really, now I take it back. I had a car, I had Cirrus radio for a while. I think I used to listen to it a little bit. Some cars I had at Sierra somewhere along the line. I don't know, 15, 20 years in. So how much longer do you see yourself in the business? And once you're done, what do you think you're going to do with your life when you grow up? Well, being in porn is like being in 13th grade forever. And I never wanted to leave high school. So, but if I quit now, I'm so old, I'm just going to die. And it's just going to be like, um, <laughs> you know, Bear Bryant, when he quit, he died. So I'll die. You think so? Yeah. Leanne like that. Well, I don't know. There's so many people that quit it, then they get back in. Like, how many comeback porns have they been with these girls? It's like every other person's doing comebacks on OnlyFans. It's insane. Yeah, but you usually don't come back when you're directing it. That's Who true. Who comes back? You know, like, porn girls, I always tell them, like, look, at, I'm going to see you when you're 18. <laughs> And if you're gone because you got a boyfriend, you know, the drummer in your band, you, he marries you or the DJ you're dating, you know, when, when one of those two guys, it's always one of those two guys, when, when you take off the drummer, the DJ or whatever, uh, I'll see you again in your early 20s. You know, they all come back around 21, 22. There's their second run. 
And it's still cute if you're a partier and everything, but yeah, you start coming back around the 25, 26 year old one. Not so good if you're still doing drugs and you're getting to that age. And then usually you'll, you'll, you'll get that fourth one when they're, they're divorced. They have a couple kids, you know, life's not so good, you know, thrown out of the bait shop or whatever. And they're, they're coming back in their early thirties. You know, usually now you have that one run, you know how it is. But nowadays with the big boom and, Milf porn, shit, they can come back at 50 if they have a good body, you know, but they all come back three or four times. Not all. I mean, I get a kick out of it. Like, like I said, like Alexis Malone, a lot of these girls I shot like back in 2002, three, four, and they're back, you know, a lot of them. So they all come back. I mean, it's good. Look at they get bored. You can't go back. You can't do this and then go back to that life. You know how it is. Come on, I'm talking to you. You know they. they I never want... went back. That's the thing. I never went back. I, I I got involved in other crazy things like wrestling, and I'm still involved in that. So maybe that's my version. But you of did stuff part. like that. A lot of these girls don't. You know what happens? They get involved with some guy for love. Oh yeah, that shit. Yeah. Okay. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Or or they tried something and they're not getting something in life. And let's face it, the biggest drug in the world is attention. Mm -hmm. And that's why they come back to this. And they need it. You know, it's it's fun. And any girl who's been through this once realizes what a circus it is and how safe it is. They really do. You know, like it's just a big fucking playground. It's the devil's playground is all it is. You know, so I think any girl that's ever done it, it's kind of fun to come back to it. Yeah, it depends on the male talent. I mean, I still have trauma from Dave Hardman. No, not real trauma. Um, I refer to him as the knuckle. I refer to those guys as the knuckleheads. Knucklehead one would be Dave Hardman. Knucklehead two was Rick Masters. Knucklehead three was Kyle Stone. But I like Kyle as a person. It was sad when he passed away. Yeah, all three of them are basically harmless. It would never hurt you or do anything, you know. Yeah, probably. You're right. Dave Hardman. Does Dave Hardman still do porn? Dave Harbin won the lottery a few years ago in New Mexico. Oh, really? Where's he living? Uh, and he's just as far, hiding out worried people are going to ask him for money. <laughs> Swear oh. to God. True oh. story. Is he married? Is he single? Does he have a girlfriend? Uh, he won't take my call because he thinks I'm asking him for money. So I don't know. <laughs> I'll find he does him. text back. And once in a while, I can text him right now. He might text me back. Tell him I was asking for him. I <laughs> He'll know what it's for then. Um, but <laughs> you know, it's funny, Ur like Earl, like like wow. Earl's guy when he got back out of prison came to me. I was shooting Earl a lot again when he got back out of prison that last time. Yeah, that that's so a sure. cautionary tale, and it's really sad because when he got out of prison, I was hoping that he would. Um, he was a good-looking guy. He had a lot going for him. I knew his family really well, and I really was hoping that he would stay sober. Then I run into him one day. Uh, I was riding my motorcycle up and up on um, PCH and I was at Neptune's net and I ran into him with some girl. I knew totally what he was doing again. And he's sitting there with a beer, you know, like something's just never changed with some of these people. And it's sad what happened to him in the end, but I am interested in Dave Hardman now. He's actually not that bad looking. Mullets are kind of cool. Um, well, Dave is 65 years old now, but he's, he, but he won the lotto. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't a huge one, but it was for Dave. That's what was life changing because he, all he was, he was being a security guard in New Mexico is what he was doing. That's sad. Well, you know, at least he yeah. won the lottery. Like that's, that's the, that is the rainbow. Yeah. That's the part yeah, Rick of Masters had a bunch of kids with Brandy Lyons, Scott Lyons ex. That's what happened to him. And he's a mechanic at, I don't know, some place in Texas somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's wonderful. Um, I I'm, I'm very happy for Dave Hardman. I'm going to look for him on Facebook later. I did want him on my podcast originally, but uh, I wonder if he went through all his money. Um. Anyway, so moving right along, uh, what do you find yourself doing on your off time when you're not shooting people fucking and sucking? Well, I still play my old punk band, so I do a little bit of that. Uh, let's see. Not much. You know, I'm married, you know, like not much. Just family type of shit, I guess. I mean, I don't really have any great hobby. <laughs> Working on the yard, whatever. Football, I go to football. I still go to punk shows, playing a punk band. You know, 
about it. Married you life. Know. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm from here, so, you know, people, I, I run to people I grew up with and stuff, so, you know, and I'm actually from the Valley, so. Did you see the movie Licorice Pizza? Yeah. Do you think it portrayed the Valley, the valley properly in that era? I saw the movie. I'm trying to remember what year was that set? Like the seventies. I used to go to Licorice Pizza all the time. Seventies. It was the Licorice Pizza right in Topanga. Uh, yeah, I guess kind of. I, I don't. That was kind of a boring movie. I mean, I did see it. I don't remember much about it. You know, I think Karate Kid portrayed the Valley better. <laughs> yeah, that was. I love that movie. That was one of my favorites. One of the actors in that passed recently, unfortunately. One of the really cute ones. Yeah, you know, Boogie Nights was a good portrayal of the Valley. Oh, of course. That was the perfect portrayal of it. You had Roller Girl. You had Mark Wahlberg portraying, you know. Yeah, the, I used to go to punk star. shows at where they opened the movie, you know, the, the nightclub they hung out at. That's the old country club. Yeah. I used, to go, I used to go to punk rock shows there. The donut store with the robbery at's right there on Sherman Way. I mean, a lot of that stuff, you see that movie. To me, that reminds me of the Valley growing up. Uh that one, or what is that? Seven Days in the Valley. There's another Valley movie. But, um, yeah, I guess Licorice Pizza, it's, it reminds you of that era. It's done well. I know that. I always wondered what the Porn Valley, what the area was like, what the Valley was like during the height of, um, you know, the 80s when they were doing porn. Because I'm not from California originally. So I guess I hopped into oh, the scene in the mid-90s. My I first time, I was 1980. Three, we're recording. My band's recording an album. I had this girlfriend. For, and there used to be a girl. Do you remember? She's before your time, but you might know of her. Do you remember Lois Ayers? With yep. The mohawk from the yep. 80s, the punk girl. Okay. She was in the punk scene. Because I'm an old punker from like the late 70s, the whole early 80s era. And um, she was trying to recruit talent because like it was. So I'm like, hey, why don't you get some of your punk friends to do porn? So she is trying to get people to do porn, the other girls. And I remember my girlfriend's like going, hey, we should do a porn for some extra money. I'm like, are you your fucking mind? <laughs> she's like, no. And, but Lois Ayers was trying to recruit people. So you're asking what was it like in the, in the Valley in the 80s? Like, it's, uh, I remember like some of the girls, like, not a lot of Valley girls really got into porn though. Because it was such in our faces porn. You didn't get a lot of people from the Valley. I mean, one girl, um, there was a, do you remember the movie Reform School Girls? Yeah. It's amazing. Okay, that movie, the blonde with the big hair, and she shows her tits and then one of those shower scenes. Like, she went to Calabasas High. She got so much shit for, like, being a slut for being that. I remember the girls that end up in Playboy and stuff. Uh -huh. I went to, you know, like, just from the punk scene and everything, or being Hustler all of a sudden. I even doing the videos. They would kind of be like, ooh, did you see what so-and-so did? But so you didn't get a lot of the girls going right into porn from the Valley. They would always be out from out of state. Yeah. You know? And to this day, how many Valley girls do you ever really see in porn when you interview them? You don't. They're all from somewhere you else. Don't. Florida. Um, None Texas. of them are from here. Yeah. Like, other, and even the crew. I'm like one of the few guys in porn that's actually from the Valley. Like, Jennifer White is probably the only true Valley girl I can think of. That did porn. You know, maybe a few in the 80s. I mean, obviously there's a few. I'm just saying most girls come from Florida, Arizona, Texas, New York, you know, wherever. They're never from here. Yeah, it was indeed a very fun time during the 90s and kind of revisiting that whole era. And, of course, hearing about Dave Hardman's recent success. Um, what do you, His recent success is a lotto winner. Uh, I'm determined to find him. So what do you have coming out next? Like, what are your projects that you have that you're working on? Well, okay. What am I about to shoot? Let's see. I'm doing a, a feature Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Mommy's Boy, a group of stepmoms and their stepsons go vacation. They all fuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a... I'm, I'm, I got to do some, um, don't tell my, don't tell my parents I asked fuck the teacher this week. So I got to butt fuck some milfs. That'll be nice. Um, I'm going to do a trans movie. I want to do, shh, don't tell anybody. I want to do, you know, Vampirella? Yeah, I do. I want to do Transparella with a trans girl. You know, the vampire? That'll be a great one in the outfit. 
costume. So I want to do that. I mean, it's, I got some new Rue I got this week. You know, I, I don't know. I really don't look past the next month or so. And if people want to watch your stuff or follow you and even your punk band, where do they go online? Okay, well, on Twitter, I'm Jim Powers XXX. And my band is Kilroy, K I L L R O Y, which is basically just on Facebook. But, you know, we play every once in a while. We're playing uh, the Big Rebellion Festival next August in England. So I'm looking forward to that because I want to go to England and play a punk show. That's about it. I mean, I shoot mostly for Gamma, so the stuff I shoot uh, shows up on, you know, like those Accidental Gangbangs, MILF Overloads. I do all that stuff now. Accidental Gangbang, MILF Overload. I do the Gender X stuff. I do Dog Fart. I do Nuru. I do Devils. I do, uh, let's see, what else? You know, Raunch. Variety of stuff. You know? I just stay busy. Definitely. I could tell. I mean, you just listed like so many things I'm dizzy, but I think that's amazing. You have to stay busy in this new, you know, social media and everything's online. It's not the same as just putting out VHS um, like we did before. So I think it's, you know, what the medium has changed. It's not different. Nothing's different. It sells, everything's still the same. If you ask me, it's just the medium changes, you know, they're just no longer, you're not the girl behind the glass anymore. You're now, you're now the hooker on the screen. That's all it is. You know, nothing's really, ch I don't think anything's really changed. It's just like the medium of getting it there. You're still making a movie. You're still making a fantasy. Whatever that fantasy might be, you're still making the movie. Because I always do try to make movies and make it entertaining. I have a theory. You know, when you die, you have to watch everything you did. So you better make it entertaining when you're stuck in there, you know? <laughs> it's like being held in the 90s. <laughs> that gives everyone a purpose to live, do interesting things. Do whatever you tell everybody, you want. Let's do a good porn today because we could all die when we leave this shoot. We could be in head-on collisions and die. So let's make a good porn movie right now. You know, you don't want to look like you're having a bad time doing it. And then people look back on it. God, not only were you doing porn, you looked pathetic. Have a good time. Then you can say, I was out of my mind. I didn't mean to know what I was doing. You know, have a good time. Have That's a good words time. words I live by. <laughs> That's the takeaway today, folks. Have a good time doing whatever it is you're doing. Because when you die, you're going to have that rewind and you're going to watch everything. Right? Exactly. Yeah, fun. Yes, yeah, so at least you should be laughing, and you know, in St. Peter or whoever's at the gates having to watch everything with you. That's good. Well, those are very good words to live by. So thanks for joining us, and sit tight.